Hi, so today we're going to be looking at the next step, which is how to use the book, this book, The Divine Encounter. Um, and this is really just like a, 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 a guideline and a manual for you to connect with the Lord. And um, so you might have a copy, a hard copy of it or a PDF. It's actually good to have a hard copy or PDF version of this, which I can, you'll get a hold of either that or a Kindle version. But if you're in if you're in a PDF mode, you must just open the tab on the on the left hand side, and I can just show you later. But I'll, on the left hand side, you see the entire index, and that index is like a menu in a restaurant. So you can use it like a menu, and you can actually go up and down, and the Holy Spirit can lead you. And you just say, look, if I look at my menu. So when I open it up in the morning, okay, for you guys sitting here, you can't see what I can see, but uh, the ones that are watching the video, well, I'm going to actually put a video with this on it, but. You will see from the introduction and you can click on anything here because now I'm, I'm looking at the index and I can click um, and it starts with the introduction where, where I am now and then we go on here, start here, which is the opening prayer and dedication, G meeting Jesus, your high priest, entering into his rest through surrender, communion. You've got all these different components that you, the Holy Spirit suddenly says you need to focus on communion now. All right, you go there, there's all the scriptures, there's the prayers there if you want to use them. Just as the Holy Spirit wants. It's not a... It's not, a, it's not a prescribed thing that you have to do all 17 prayers or something like that. That's nothing. This is just something that you've got a scriptural basis to focus on. So if you're battling, if you're battling to connect, use it. It helps me and it's, it's helping so, it has helped so many people um, in very intense situations. I'm people that can't pray. They've been raped. They've, been, they've had major trauma. I give them this and it's, it's basically God uses this to set them free because they're able to connect. Because otherwise they're too distracted to be able to connect. So it's a very, that's that's why it's so useful because it's it helps you to focus and it helps me to focus. So I know the pattern, so I can use it any time out of my mind, uh, because I can remember it. But what happens is sometimes I get so distracted that I've got to use it. <laughs> and actually, it's better better most of the time to use it because um, I've actually forgotten some of the stuff that's in there, the gold. And when I say the gold, I'm talking the scriptures on it. And you start to pray. It's very powerful when you pray the scriptures. And you, if you start praying the scriptures and the scriptures are on point, they're on topic. And you suddenly start, as you're praying, getting revelation of what you're praying. And the Spirit starts to flow and the anointing starts to flow based on the Word of God, the revelation of the Word of God. Um, then, you, then your prayer starts to flow because you, the anointing on the Word brings you into His presence and His presence sets you free. So if you have that combination of His presence and His, and His Word and the revelation of His Word, you are then in Canonia with Him. And that's where, you get, that's where He sets you free. And that's what He saved us for, is that fellowship with Him. And then you just go as the Holy Spirit leads you. Okay, so um, what, I, what I just wanted to say, how to use the book, just, just use your, the, the chapters, uh, the index on the left-hand side, whether you're in a PDF or Kindle or whatever, or on your computer. If you've got the book, obviously you can just turn to the beginning and just just have that index available so you can see okay now i need to actually tap into the seven spirits of god now sometimes you can't remember them okay i can remember the seven spirits of god but you might think what is what is the fifth one you know what comes after the spirit of counsel you know and, and so you know how do you pray that now how do you get full of the seven spirits of god if you don't know what they are you can't remember it's isaiah 11 verse 2. so you need to know, okay, oh, armor of God. What's the armor? Maybe you forget your, 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 your belt. <laughs> your pants are going to fall down. So you, you need to be able to have the whole armor of God, okay? So you need to know what it is. And then, then you've you got the scriptures for that. And then you need to know what are the nine fruit of the Spirit. And then to be filled with the nine fruit of the Spirit. I would say daily, but uh, you might not have the time to have that daily, but as often as you can, to get filled with the, with the seven spirits of God, the nine fruit of the Spirit, and then obviously tapping into the nine gifts of the Spirit. And every day it's an infilling. That's just the infilling. Never mind the, the breathing out. So as we know it's the breathing out, then the breathing in, and then the breathing out. Okay, so, so what happens is the hour of power, the first part of the whole book is the hour of power, which is the expanded prayer points, okay, which came from a document that is literally two pages. It was two pages, okay? That expanded into now a book that's 230 pages. So the two pages of a prayer guideline God gave me, um, I started to print. And then then I, I just couldn't contain it. It was like, you know, the, I need to write this stuff out. I started writing it out and then it just came into the book. 
Okay, but that original prayer guideline, which is two pages, is a concentrate. It's just verse. It's just scriptures. Just scriptures and a few words on it. But that's the guide, basic guideline God gave me about and surrender, repentance, and the scriptures. Because when we are praying, we need to actually be scriptural. We need to be on the word. We need to know what the word is saying about repentance. What does one John one nine say? You know, if you don't know that, you need to at least read it. You know, 1 John 9 says, If you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Now, that is a foundational uh, teaching and, and revelation that we need to know. So, I confess my sins. He's forgiven me. Thank you that you forgive me. Some people cannot get into God's presence and they're struggling. And they're struggling so much. They're in a worship service, right? So, they come in there. They've confessed their sins. Let's say they confess their sins and the devil says, God hasn't forgiven you. And they still can't break through and they're waiting for something to happen they're feeling terrible and then eventually the worship stops and then the pastor starts preaching. And hopefully somewhere in the sermon, by the Spirit, he'll pick up on that. A word will get to them and they'll, uh, they'll get free from condemnation. Or they walk out the service with condemnation. Then they don't come back for another three years. And we call them a backslider. Why? Because we're not meeting the needs of the sheep. We're not ministering to the sheep. We're not feeding the sheep. God says, if you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me, Tend my sheep and feed my lamb. So God is saying we need to really minister to the sheep and give them what is relevant that's going to help them instead of discussing very what are non-essentials. We need to give them the things that's going to help them the most. So if you, let's say the Lord said to you, I'm giving you three years with somebody and then you've never seen them again. And, they, and then they, you're leaving. In fact, you're dying. What would you do? What would you do? Well, I would recommend you go and look what Jesus did and do that. Because <laughs> that's what he did. He had three and a half years to spend and to plant the church. The entire church. And he didn't choose the Bible school students. He chose just normal people in business and tax collecting sinners. He called them together. And then he walked with them. And they followed him. A little bit different to what we do today. But that's what he did. He made disciples. Okay. And uh, then he filled them with his spirit. And then they discipled nations and they turned the world upside down. Just a few of them. They didn't even have the internet. They didn't have loudspeakers. They didn't have keyboards. They didn't have sound systems. They didn't have CDs. They didn't have books. In fact, the only Bible they had was the Old Testament. <laughs> you understand that? They didn't have the New Testament. They were the New Testament. Okay, so what happens is they were preaching on scriptures out of the Old Testament with so much... Revelation. Look at look at when Stephen when he was preaching. Where what Bible was he using? So it's like they are preaching with such revelation, and they were testifying of Jesus everywhere they went. There were signs following, miracles following. And I say, well, what is just so different between them and us? Well, the main difference is they were disciples. Other difference is a disciple knows Jesus. A disciple knows his voice, and that's really where we got to get back to. He's making disciples or. Let's rather say becoming a disciple. Step one. Step two is making disciples. Okay, so, so what happens is you go through somewhere. You, there's 12 major points. Okay, just to mention the points now, just so that you can you know what the 12 points are before you get to the sword. There's two parts of the book. The out power and the second part is the sword of the spirit. The sword of the spirit is a, procl and a whole list of proclamations from building your faith, seeking his kingdom, uh, forgetting the past, the, the, the defeat of the enemy, finances, healing. So if you're battling with healing, you just take out the sword and you start meditating on those scriptures. You start proclaiming those scriptures. You take the sword, you've got to speak it out your mouth. You can't just think the, the thoughts, you've got to speak it out your mouth. But the our power is about the, 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 the exhaling, the inhaling, and then the exhaling. And basically it starts off with the, the point one. And the, the, the first point is... The opening prayer and dedication is just committing your heart to the Lord. Second point is Jesus the high priest. Third point is entering his rest through surrender. Fourth one is communion. These are like the essentials of basic prayer for me. Okay, the pillars of basic prayer. Like um, basic prayer, I'd say divine encounter because prayer is limiting it. Even the word prayer is limiting. That's why I use the word divine encounter because in the divine encounter is prayer and is worship. In prayer, there's not necessarily worship. So when you have a quiet time, it also limits you. Please don't call it a quiet time. Because there will be a moment of silence in heaven. So, but... 
uh, and for up an hour. And uh, <laughs> that's it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. So, we, so, so at the end of the day, it's like these are the, these are the essentials. Look, there might be something missing. I'm not saying this is the the ultimate list, but these are the essentials that I put just in the d- divine encounter. Then I put a sword of the spirit, which is the second part of the book. Um, so you got communion. The sec. Uh, okay, so just think how important communion is. A guy like Smith Wigglesworth used to have a little communion set. Every day he used to have communion with the Lord himself. Okay? I'm talking physical communion with the Lord. Then putting on the cloak of humility. How important is that? Okay? Um, putting on the armor of God. How important is that? Uh, filling with his spirit. Okay? Now that's... Filling with his spirit is not... Uh, I mean, it's a whole list of things there because it's actually receiving the seven spirits of God. Okay? The nine fruit of the Spirit, the nine gifts of the Spirit, and receiving His fullness. He's also the Spirit of glory, by the way. He is the, called the Spirit of glory. Um, and then, after we've been filled with the Spirit, you can always say, I, I want more. If you're still hungry, you can fill, get filled with Jesus. This is, this is getting filled with the Trinity now. And when you're full of Jesus, He takes you to the Father. You get full of the Father. So now you've you got full of the Spirit. You're full of the, Jesus. And you follow the Father's love, and then you can get filled with the Word. Then He can start you on a whole Bible study. You can go and do a topical study. God can show you whatever He wants in the Word. And then your personal sword of the Spirit, which is now your own proclamations that God's given you to proclaim over your family, over your business, over the nation. That's when you need to make your declarations, your decrees. Okay, this is basically your, your responsibility as a priest. <laughs> These are the kind of like, this is, this is what you need to do as a priest. We are called, all of us, as priests. Okay? This is not the list for your pastor. This is your list for you to do as a priest. And then the final one is giving him our love. That's the final breathing out. Well, breathing out, this is now in your divine encounter, is TPW. Thanksgiving, praise, and worship. So now that you finish your, your, your divine encounter with TPW, what do you do? You carry on breathing out. You go out of your closet, and you go into the world, and you breathe on all the people. You love them, you bless them, you prophesy over them, and you heal them. And and if you're in business, you do business the way Jesus would do business. Okay, and and that's it. And that's what you do. And then you go and make disciples. They see what the fragrance of Christ on us. They see the joy on you now because you got full of joy. And they look at the joy in you and they say they want what you've got. What did you get? You got to get it all in the morning. There used to be an advert like it. You get it all in the morning. It was some uh, cornflake. I don't know what yeah, it was. All brand. All brand. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, Kellogg's. Okay. Yeah, I got it all this morning. Yes. Well, I mean, really, if you know what's in that stuff, you didn't get it all. So, <laughs> all right. So that's just uh, a nonsense story. You never get it all if you eat some, some cereal. But if you can say, I got it all this morning. All right. That's why Jesus got up early. He made sure he got it all. Because he knows the devil is coming for him. But when the devil saw him, the devil ran. When the devil sees you and you're full with God's glory, he will flee. Amen. He will do the seven-way split. <laughs> that's quite a difficult split to do, you know. Two-way split's one thing, but a seven-way split, that's what the enemy's going to do. So, all right, so then we, we, we move on to the sword of the Spirit. These are powerful declarations written in the sword of the Spirit and that you can go through. So the, the, the sword of the Spirit is really there for areas where you're battling. Or you specifically warring on at this time. Let's say you're warring on your on your health and you want God to heal you. Well, then you go there and you just pop over and you can obviously write more. This is not everything written on healing, but I've got a section here on healing. Okay, um, and yeah, I'll just read it to you. So let's say you're battling um, with, with with health, your health, and you can say, okay, it says, yeah, all things are possible to them that believe. That's the first line. You can just meditate on that, because that's actually I'm quoting scripture. All, poss- all things are possible to believe. Okay, so I must believe. Yes. Forgive me for not believing I'm healed. Okay. I believe now that I must, I'm healed. Spirit, soul, and body according to the word of God. I live in divine health as Holy Spirit quickens my body. Okay, so, so, and then you just start quoting. I've got scriptures. All the healing scriptures. And you just start quoting the scriptures. You just speak the scriptures over your body. You sp- okay, so that's healing. Then there's finances. There's your, you're battling on finance. You want to go to finance? You click on a finance. You turn to that chapter. You go there and say, okay, Father, I ask you to expose and deliver me from the spirit of mammon. I always start with a bit of deliverance. Uh, that's quite useful. In case you didn't get delivered in the first section, you get it. Yeah. 
Show me where I have the hat or covering of mammon in my life, which is made of fear. Help me to take off this false hat. Cover my mind with faith, hope, and love. Thank you, Abba, that I'm more valuable to you than the billions of birds that you faithfully... These are prayers God gave me over the years. When I'm battling with something, I actually go and pray. And then I, I write out the prayer. And that's what I, these, are, these are actually prayers that I prayed. Then I go and get scriptures. Then I, I mean, it's taking me... I cannot tell you how long this is taking me to put together because I, I put it together for myself as a weapon. So wherever I go, I can actually... If I have got the time and I can focus, I will get through anything based on what he's given me in this treasure chest called the divine account. <laughs> it's the most amazing thing because I've got all of it in one place. Even when it comes to deliverance, when you're going through trauma, you, there's a place in here you can get delivered from trauma. Praying and connecting with the Holy Spirit where he can deliver you from trauma in your life. And you've got people going through trauma, so they've got to go for trauma counseling. I say, no, go to the Holy Spirit. But you need to know how to go to the Holy Spirit. You need to know what to pray. And you need to let, let him minister to you because we've got to start teaching people to, to connect with God as opposed to going to the local guru or to whoever and everything. Like Yongi Chan says, when people come to him with a problem, you know Yongi Chan, you don't know, he's got one of the biggest churches in the world. I think it, anyway, he's got a place called Prayer Mountain. You know, and that's unfortunately what we don't have in the, in the West. That's the East. Yeah, there they pray. Yeah, we just do home cell. Okay, there they pray as well. Okay, so that's why it's a bit different. So we do home cell without prayer. They do, they do home cell with prayer. <laughs> Big difference. Big difference. Very big difference. They go to prayer mountain. So you know what he says? They come for counseling. He says, go and pray on the mountain for three days. That's most of his counseling. He tells them to go to pray. Uh, three days go and pray. That's your prescription. Now, we want a McDonald's church. The pastor will pray for you. The pastor will get you delivered. And that's why you're paying the pastor. That's absolute nonsense. We're, this is not Mac Church, not drive through church. Uh, give me whatever. All right, I'll pay you to go up the mountain, Moses. Moses is dead. The priesthood must arise. Everyone is a priest of God. Every disciple is a priest. So that can you imagine from the time you were born again, somebody's telling you, you need to connect with the Lord. And the most important thing in your life is that you hear from God. Huh? Is that what you heard? No. You've got to be in the worship team. You've got to be getting people saved. All this stuff. you got to be doing this, this, and this, and this. And you got to go to three meetings a week. And you got to hear the word. Okay, those are relevant. But at the end of the day, the most important thing is, is connecting. Knowing God. Fellowshipping. That is eternal life. Okay. So we need to make disciples. But what's the point if you get someone saved and then leave them on the pavement? What's the point? If we are not discipling people, but we're getting them saved. Jesus didn't say go into all the world and get everyone saved. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a statement in the, one of the latest books of Rick Joyner called The Path. In there, it's, it's God is talking to him or the Lord's talking to him or someone's talking to him and saying that your generation, this generation is facing the greatest indictment of all the different generations. You know what the indictment is? We've got the biggest harvest in with the fewest disciples. So we have failed our commission in this generation. So we are praying for harvest and God is actually praying for disciples. Yeah. He never said go and actually get all the nations saved. Yeah. He said go and make disciples teaching them yes. all that I have commanded you. That's the red letters. Yes. All that I've commanded you. Yes. And we're not, doing the t we're not teaching Jesus writings. We're teaching them other things. We focus then on Paul's writings, but not Jesus. And Paul, Jesus is the foundation of what Paul wrote. We need what Paul wrote, but we need what Jesus wrote more. All right, so it's the cornerstone. So we've got to get back to the foundation. We've got to say, right, when we get someone saved, what do you do with them? You've got to make disciples. We've got to make disciples. And so that has been my quest, is to find out how to fulfill the, fulfill the Great Commission. Because God said, make disciples. And He said, you Warren, have to make disciples of nations. So I, I said, oh, that's quite a task. How do we do that? He says, one person at a time. Mm -hmm. He didn't say, no, you've got to hire a stadium, Warren. Mm -hmm. You don't make disciples by hiring stadiums. You make converts like this. Jesus never hired a stadium. He made 12 disciples. One fell away. He made 12 disciples and changed the world. We try and make 12,000 converts and change nothing. That's why nothing is changing. Because no one's changing. 
And so the discipleship is what we've, we've missed out. And the, the number one thing for disciples is divine encounter. Connect with the Lord. Those 12 disciples, including Judas, had a divine encounter every day, 365 days a year. For three and a half years. Can you imagine? Every day you're talking to Jesus. Live. Every day you're seeing Jesus doing miracles. I mean, can it be? I mean, what? You want to go to Bible school? Uh, excuse me, Jesus. I've got to go to Bible school now. <laughs> you know, they're doing lectures. Uh, what? He said, follow me. He never sent them to seminary. He never sent them to the Bible school. I'm not saying it's a bad thing to go to Bible school. But what we're doing is we're not doing what Jesus did. We are actually trying to copy the school system. The school system is not Jesus' system. It's not Jesus. Jesus never came and set up a school. He never set up a university. He made disciples. They ate with Him. They talked with Him. They slept with Him on the ground. For three and a half years. That's how He makes disciples. By example. No theory. Example. You want to know how to cast a demon? Watch me. Walk with me. Follow me. Come stay with me. Then you see what discipleship is. And so when he, he was a disciple who made disciples. So we've gone so far from the pattern of Jesus. And then he one day said to me, do you think you've improved? Do you think you've improved in 2,000 years on my methods? <laughs> ah, that's a tri trick question. <laughs> Uh, obviously, no, no, sorry, Lord, you know, internet, no, we've got a bit clever, we've got TV now, you know, we've got TV evangelists, yeah, we've got all these people doing a lot, people are getting saved every day, they're getting saved 15 times a year now, yes. but they're not getting discipled, so he said, no, he asked me that question, that's when he started teaching me about discipleship, because I said, Lord, show me the pattern of the church, and then, you know what the pattern of the church is, he says, I am the pattern of the church. <laughs> he is the button. He is the cornerstone. He is the foundation. He is everything. He says, follow me. Oh, okay. Where do we start to follow him? Go to Matthew 1. That's where you start. And then read verse, chapter 2 and 3 and 4 and follow him through the page and say, what did he do? And what am I doing? What is so different? And then start to learn the way he does things because he is the one that is the master discipler. He created us in his image. He comes down to earth and he shows us Discipleship, which the best terminology the world can give us today is coaching and mentoring. But Jesus called it discipleship. Okay. Big businesses, they know the value of mentorship and coaching. But they cannot match Jesus, the ultimate coach and mentor. And so what Jesus is saying, we should be far ahead when it comes to training. We should be the best trainers in the world. If we get the pattern right. If we get, in other words, we've got to learn how to learn, step one, and then we've got to learn how to teach others to learn. That's it. That's discipleship. Okay. I'm strong on this. There's a strong, strong thing on discipleship now, but I, I cannot touch on one without going into the other. I cannot say make disciples without teaching on divine encounter. I cannot touch on divine encounter without making disciples because the whole purpose, one of our main purposes on earth is to make disciples, not the evangelists. The evangelist's job is to train up other people to do evangelism, not to do the evangelism. He says, the work of the ministry. Teach them to evangelize. Then you multiply yourself. The problem is evangelists have been trying to do all the work. Pastors have been trying to do all the pastoring. No, that fivefold gift that we have, God has given into the body is to teach others to do what you're doing. Not so that you can do it. You're not the master evangelist. He is the master evangelist. He says, right, now release that on other people. Get them together and say, right, let me teach you on evangelism how you can go and get people saved. That's our job as evangelists. Pastors, the same thing. Shepherd. How do you shepherd people? You go to a shepherd and say, teach me how to shepherd. Oh, okay. And then prophet. Okay, what's a prophet teach you? A prophet teaches you how to hear God. <laughs> we all should be hearing God. That's a part of the fivefold ministry. Okay, and then, the, and then, and then you've, you've got the teacher. Okay, teacher is there to, to, to release the teaching gift in you so that you can teach. How are you going to teach your children? God says, train up your children. You say, I'm not a teacher. I, I know what I'll do. I send them to school. Oh, send them to school. No wonder we've got such a sick world. We've sent our children to school. And you're getting your children trained by sick people to become more sick. And the, and the whole system is sick. And it's getting sicker because 
Babylon has got the school system and now what they're teaching your children in grade one, grade two, they're teaching them about all this rubbish. And now what? God says it's not their job to train your children. It's your job. You train up your children. Ah. Hmm. So he said, when you get to heaven, he's not going to judge the teachers for training your children the wrong things. He's going to judge you for sending them to the wrong school. <laughs> or for sending them to school at all. He said, did you really pray about that decision? Or did you just go with the flow? Because everyone sends to school. I had a question yesterday. I mean, this guy was asking me, my neighbor was asking, have you thought about school? No. Oh, for the children, I'm like, yeah, I have to have a lot of thought about that. So I don't know if you want to hear the answer. <laughs> So I had to give him an answer, but it took about half an hour. <laughs> Just to tell him what's going on in the world and how, what, what a world we're living in. And uh, my responsibility is to train up my children. Yeah. God will judge me for that one day. Okay. All right. So anyway, the Lord wants us to, to, to have that encounter as often as possible. Um, I'm not saying every time you pray that you're going to have to go through all of these 12 points. If you could and you can, phenomenal. Okay, but it will take you hours, not one hour to do it. Because once you start, it just, you just connect and then it just things happen. So, um, so now the prayer tools, I think I've covered these before. But anyway, it's very good, important when you pray, have your Bible, pen, prayer journal, workbook, your diary, your prayer list, your, some memorial stones. I've got documents all over the place when I talk about memorial stones. Those are my testimonies. So when I'm, if you're feeling a bit discouraged, there's nothing like picking up your memorial stones <laughs> and pick them up. I've got on my journal, I click on there, memorial stones, back to Timbuktu, right back to Adam and Eve, I've got memorial stones. So I, I, it's like, boom, bang, I can start thanking God. I get through 10 stones, the depression is gone. Discouragement's gone. I, just with my memorial stones. It's like, there's, there's just so much available to you and I to actually get into his presence that he's provided we just the problem is we get so distracted we forget what we got so I like lists and I say, oh, in case you forget oh, yeah, memorial stones. why don't you go back your eternal plan where's your eternal plan your eternal plan and God plan for your life written it out strategy mission mission what has he called you to do your purpose you go back to that document and say what am I called for what is my purpose you must have it written down what are your scriptures for your life write it down Occasionally you go and visit that document with the Holy Spirit and look at it and he says, you must change this. This is changing. But yeah, this is your focus. Write it down. I got it on my mirror in my bedroom, in the, in, in the, in the bathroom. I got my laptop, got my phone, and I got it in my office. And I got it in the fridge now. <laughs> the vision for my family. You know, in one page. That's my vision. Okay, so I'm going to focus on that. God says, write the vision. Make it plain on tablets. Now we've even got tablets. Jeez, we, tablets used to be you know, out of fashion. We used to have books. Now we've got tablets. We've got phones. Put on your phone. Read it out loud. Over your family, over your children, over your nation. What's the vision for the nation? Write it down. So that's your eternal plan. So that's now when you come to pray, you come prepared because you're meeting the King of Kings. Come with your documents. Come with your laptop. Come with whatever you're going to write it down. Say, Lord, here I am. I surrender these tools now because he'll use whatever he wants. Look, if, if you're going to come have an hour power and you just open up and you say, Lord, here I am, and suddenly you get taken to heaven, you won't have to worry about all the stuff I've just told you now. <laughs> because you never, it's like, hey, hallelujah. You, I mean, it's like if that happens every time, don't worry about anything. <laughs> because then you're in heaven, you know, you'll get it all. You come back, you say, I got it all. I say, fantastic. I can see you glowing. Moses got it all. 40 days, 40 nights, no eating, no drinking, comes back shining like a bulb. I say, hey, divine encounter. You know, did you put your arm on? <laughs> God has got a way of actually meeting your needs and, and, and delivering you and healing you and filling you all in one shot. You know what I mean? So it's not like I say, well, you've got to take it and you've got to do this step and that. No. What you've got to do is you've got to get close to God. And if you're battling, use the God. If you're not battling, Hallelujah. <laughs> Carry on. But I've got this because it helped me. And I know that people that just get saved need a guideline. They need some teaching. And then when they start to fly, they start to know, okay, now how to fly. I know how to fly. I know when I miss it. I just repent. I say, yeah, you're getting the basic, basic principles of, of, of connecting with God. And you need to know those basic principles. So the first thing I know is the most important thing is surrender. Just surrender. Hallelujah. 
Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. So let's just start there. Father, we just come to you now in Jesus' name. We just want to say thank you that you're teaching us to make disciples. You're teaching us to connect with you. You're teaching us how to be disciples on purpose. We've got to do this, this thing with intent, Lord. Help us to be intentional about being a disciple. To be intentional about connecting with you and being intentional to make disciples. Help us, Father, to be faithful with your commands. Help us to do your commands because you're doing it in us and through us into the nations. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Father, for your glory. Your glory is coming to our town. Amen. Just say that. The glory of the Lord is coming to my town. Hallelujah. And then tell your neighbor when you see them, the glory is co Lord's coming to town. And if you go visit the town, the, glo the glory is coming, coming to your town. God's glory wants to go across the earth. He says His glory covers the earth. So there isn't a town that God's glory doesn't want to go to. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.